I'd like to actually start to just tease out and discuss why our workplace is like that. I mean, what's the past all have been all about? And then kind of what's happening now. And so we'll see hopefully the drivers coming through to what's happening now. And any guesses for the future? Because you know, it's kind of safe talking about the future, because it's never here. You never quite be wrong. So maybe I'll be right sometimes. And then I want to talk a little bit about what's what's this got to do with psychology? And then maybe leave you with some things to think about. And like I said, I set myself a challenge. I don't know why. I kind of think of these things. I had jet lag, so that might be why. <laughs> Three in the morning, I'm thinking, what can I do that will be fun? So I'd like to just present one slide, if I can. And that's the slide. But I'm going to build it up slowly and tell you a story where we're going. And I've got the slide for everyone if you want it. If you can remember the story, you can tell it again. So like I said, the key will give me um, a way of navigating through. I hope you can remember kind of what those little symbols were all about. The first question I wanted to ask is really what is a workplace for? Deconstruct what a workplace is so that we really get back to the roots. When we're designing and conceiving the workplaces of the future, I really think it's important to understand what, what it was all about in the first place. I think there's four key things that a workplace does and did and still does. Initially, workplaces were containers of all the technical tools that you might need for your work. The things that we couldn't afford or didn't want the risk of having in our homes. There was a place to put the things we needed to make and do to actually execute the work. And the fact that we had them together in one place actually gave us a bit of efficiency. So if we're producing something, we can just hand it to the next person. So it actually created speed to market. So that's what a workplace started to do. If you collate the process, and put the equipment and the technical tools, you can collate the processes and start to lay out what those processes might be to get the most efficient and speedy way of doing it. But they did more than that. And these last two things are really about uniting. So workplaces did more than just put stuff in one place. It wouldn't matter where that was if that was the real case. But what workplaces did and still do is unite people under a common purpose. They express the mission, the standing of an organization. They express the, the goals, like what's it for? You go, imagine going to work in the money box building when that was first built. That would say something about that business. It could communicate wordlessly what it was all about. And rather than just communicating wordlessly, they do more than that. They actually communicate about opportunity. So they say, this is the process. This is the equipment we need. This is who we are. And if you start here, this is where you could go. It develops the individual, gives a sense of where you fit into the machine, and in fact, that gives you a drive and an ambition, potentially ignites an ambition. You think again about the money box building. You could see, oh, I can't wait to get to the top floor. You could see how it would kind of work that way. And it didn't just, it didn't just spark ambition. It actually sparked a duty of care between the organization and the employee as well, where healthcare services could be bundled up for the employees. Where different ways of um, developing and learning and teaching could be encouraged. So I've talked a bit about the past, and just to reiterate that, I guess if we look back in the past, it's quite simplified. In the part, using the analogy of photography, as we workplace consultants have done for years, um, this is obviously the past was about multiple handling. You see in the old days, it was about something physical, getting produced. It was about a production line efficiency. This is Frederick Taylor. And in the old days, that's what a workplace was. It was. I would hand a piece of paper to you, and it would get quicker and quicker. There were some really interesting early explorations of how to better design offices called bureau landscapes, and many of you in here will know that. They were kind of a, a more of a geographic description of a process. And it was trying to take production line theory into the white collar work, which is really interesting. In terms of an expression and a uniting of people, again, I used the Money Ox building, and there it is on the left there, just to say, look, wow, these buildings were making a statement. Even what the building was made of made a real difference. This was a place. You know, the fabric, maybe that's still why we ask, where do you work, rather than who do you work for, probably is our default. So where do you work? It's actually maybe the default question, because, because of some of that. And like I said before, in the past, personal development was something that the workplace offered because it was a collection, a company of people, keeping company with each other. And when you keep company with people, you look after each other, and you have that duty of care, and that development, of course. So where's that? That's all quite easy to understand. That's what a workplace is for. So where's that gone? Clearly, stretching my analogy, photography, even further. Today, 
we have a digital workplace. Obviously, the technical tools have shrunk an awful lot, and lots is becoming highly digital, and that's just going to increase. And like I always say, you see these photographs, these little pictures here, and any of you with children under about 12, or they won't know what either of those things are, because that's actually what a camera is to the next generation, the millennial, or those, whoever comes after millennials, I don't know. <laughs> the alpha generation or the Zs, I don't know what they are. But that's now what the uh, Samsung Galaxy, they're calling it the live companion. And our technical tools are now becoming mobile. In fact, totally on your mobile. Now, not all of them, we get that. But the idea of the workplace as a container of technical tools is absolutely shifting. It's becoming much more of a technical technology uh, brief, absolutely. But we still need the right tools to do the job. I just think the tools and the work has changed, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute so much. Maybe we're accommodating the wrong things. I see a layout of an open plan office today, and it just is there for the computers to be sat on. That's kind of what they are. Even though we're on flat screens and laptops and so forth, we're still using those surfaces to just put those things down. And I don't know if that's always wrong, but I'd love to question whether that's really good for us. We still need to feel competent. We still need the tools for the job. I just task you to tell me to think about is how we got the right things accommodated in our homes, in our workplaces. The employee contract we call the contract between the organization and the individual. What do you expect when you sign that employee contract? What do you expect that's not written down in black and white? Do you expect to be looked after? It's still critically important that people feel competent and able to deliver their job. But are we just accommodating the tools in the wrong way? So let's move over and build up the grid a little more. From Frederick Taylor and the production line theory, it's clearly not just about being a container of workplace, it's about doing it efficiently. But work has changed. So all of this stuff I talked about, the digital tools and the technology, has shifted the processes that we lined up, even in bureau landscape where it was all wiggly and wonderful. Those processes are largely digital, and they fly around the air just as we speak now without being physically manifested. We don't need to do that passing of the paper from place to place. Knowledge work, uh, sorry, the advent of technology has shifted us into knowledge work, something we clearly all understand and know about a little bit. When we break down and deconstruct knowledge work, what is it? It's an intermittent flick between the highly focused and creational work, strategy work. You know that thing where you think, I'm really getting some work done here? Mm -hmm. That work? Not emailing necessarily. I'm really getting some work done here. That work. And then the communicative work. The work where we need to communicate and talk to each other. Maybe sharing what we've done. Maybe teaching others. Maybe meeting and reaching consensus. Knowledge work is significantly different from process work. And often un underestimated. If 90% of the layouts that we see in the city are to be an indicator. Which is still laid out. <laughs> like a process. Focused creational work, as I described it, that thing that where you think you're really getting some work done, I think it's highly personal. You ask people where they have their life, I'll ask you now to, in your minds, think about the last place you had a great idea or you really got some work done. To the point where you lost track of time, that thing, that thing where you're in the zone, maybe with one other, maybe with a small team, but probably likely that most of us have to do stuff on our own. It's very personal. We did this around the room the other day on a wonderful project. and. Everyone had a different, there's some things in common, but oh, at home, on the train, um, I was sitting on the floor, on the beach, you know, you get that, that thinking space, or, you know, just, just on my own in my study. There are tons of very different, in the office, after hours, someone said, I feel like I get all my work done in my spare time. Mm -hmm. So that height, you know, it's really different where you're really doing the work. So it's highly personal. Are we designing for that? Are we accommodating that? Are we giving people competence to do that and the tools to do that? I, I question. But what's the one thing we have the other side? I've talked about focused work, but what's the other side that I talked about is communicative work or collaborative work? I'm slightly allergic to the word collaborative, but I'll go there. I use it all the time. No one knows what it means. But anywho, I won't go on. But um, collaborative or creative, um, communicative work is really something I don't believe will ever be replaced by technology. It's the one thing. Video conferencing a bit, I get, I get that. And emailing, of course, has taken that away. But when you, the reason I think this is, we escalate face to face. I, you know, you email, tap an email, hey, can I, uh, can I get this off you today? 
Oh, no, sorry, mate, I'm too busy. Back in an email. So you pick up the phone. Really, I, it's really, I need it today. Oh, I'm really busy, but maybe I can fill in. Hey, why don't we meet? I'll walk through it and we'll do it together. Or we'll have you escalate to face to face. We do it all the time. There's something we can't replace about face to face. And I think it's about connecting. I think it's about a real human inside, innate quality that we need to see each other's eyes. We can be, we can be quite blunt when we're face to face, but you can't do it on an email or on the phone. You can be concise but respectful. You can be creative. You can gain consensus. God, in about five minutes, over 55 emails, you can get consensus in the room. Engage the sentiment of what's going on. And you can be conceptual, which is really hard. Have you ever had to write that email where you've got to get a big idea over to 15 people in three countries? Oh, God, it just kills you. Because you know in five minutes you can tell people and you can express your passion. I think this is a thing we can't replace. So the future of workplace is it really dealing with that today? If we really think that this is the bit that we can't place on technology, that our focus work is highly personal, maybe it could be accommodated better in the workplace. What would the workplace of the future look like? Is it activity-based working? Some of you in the room will know exactly what activity-based working is. I'm going to preach to the converted, or maybe not preach, but I'll talk to the converted. Activity-based working is what you're seeing now as an emergence in workplace design. It is a system of a layout of a workplace strategy that doesn't assign you a piece of furniture to own, but provides you with a range of settings which you can use depending on what you're doing. So the theory is sound. You might go and focus in an office when you really want to get that work done. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> is that my time up? Look how many times I've got that. So it, the theory is sound, and what I think it does really, really well, activity-based working, is allow us to have different types of face-to-face. -face. This uh, understanding of a range of settings for communication is really interesting. It's not always great to be in a meeting room, and we needed to explore what a meeting was, and activity-based working has done a fantastic job in doing exactly that. It's explored us working together with screens, and so much more open plan style meetings, which is great. They love not getting dragged to a room every five minutes and sitting there for exactly an hour. Why? What for? You just five minutes, but just stand up and do it. Activity-based working tackles that, and it's fantastic. Macquarie Group, the first activity-based workplace in Australia, three, three and a half thousand people. And the first time we've done it, we learned an awful lot. Since leaving Macquarie, we've been involved in a number of other projects that do the same. But is it the future of workplace? I don't know. I think we've learned, we're working. A, we're learning an awful lot from it. And I will never give away what we've learned. Those workplaces are are superb, and they speak to the agenda of those organisations in volumes. But for me, I think we really need. If I peel back, what we really need to do, and if this is about making things efficient and speedy, is it really a great place for me as an individual to do that immersive work, that focused work? I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure we've cracked that. And I'd like to understand kind of where you've had your last good idea. I want to collect as many ideas about that focused personal work. Because if we can't do that focused personal work and be productive and get that work out the door, it creates stress. And I think stress is the beginning of every illness that we're all going to have. And if we're serious about well-being, which is a wave that's coming in through society and workplace and any topic you want to talk about, well-being is the one, we've got to deal with stress. And we have to stop designing stress in to our workplaces. We have to be very serious about designing stress out. So I love ABW, but I think we can go further. I think we could explore something that actually deletes stress. So providing, how can we provide personal sanctuary choice for people? Stress is going to kill us, so let's stop giving it to each other. So let's talk about uniting groups of people behind the mission. You know, I've talked a bit in the past, like this is all very well, let's make people confident, give them the tools. Let's make sure that they've got the right stuff when they get there to communicate, to personally focus. But what can the building say about us? How will, why will people go there? What for? Like that's all very well, but you know, I've got the tools, I've got the video cameras, I'm not going to turn up. Why would I go to the fifth floor of that building every day when I can be in my study, is the question. And that's now a reality. 
There's a reason why Google made their workplaces so appealing to that generation and provide food and all the amenities that they do. Because they're better together. We're in company. We're in a company for a reason. So the building is still important, absolutely. But as we leak out of the building and work kind of anywhere, this is a tiny, mini snapshot of MLC. And it's that food call that we started to see the expression of this in the city, the lobby cafe, the free Wi-Fi, not enough in Sydney, just came from London, there was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, more free Wi-Fi. So, um, but it's starting to leak out. And we know, we go to every cafe and there's a bit of work happening, and it's good, and it's exciting, but just it's leaking out. And I think that trend will just continue. I'm sure that's not remotely rocket science at all. The building and the place will be the major draw card, be a major draw card, I should say, for the next generation places that offer not just the cafes, places that offer stuff for our kids, stuff for my lifestyle, a bit of ping pong, whatever kind of gets you going. Something's aligned to you, right? Something that really works for your life. Sometimes you don't say, oh, I love working. I love working for the least because they do me this, this. It's more. It's not just the brand. It's actually the whole experience of work. It'd be really interesting to not just think about the furniture, but think about everybody's journey to work and how can we make it just that bit better. We get more people walking to work because that's good for your brain and so forth. So how does that work? And authenticity is key. You probably couldn't have a walking to work strategy if you worked for Ford Motors, for example. So you've got to make it kind of talk, you laugh at yeah, people who are into that, don't you? You don't want to work for ActionAid and, and be at the top of Chipley Tower. And it has to kind of work. So I, I urge you to think big and think what is the value proposition of our business? And then what should our property strategy be? And then maybe one of the ingredients we need are the technical tools in that order. So think, think big. And what about Barangaroo? <laughs> this is the only bit where I get a little plug for none of this stuff. It's interesting, it's a whole new city piece of the puzzle. And we're thinking in these larger terms, is it, it's important for Sydney and the 30,000 workers who will turn up every day, or most of them unless they're working from home doing that stuff. But they may be. And I think we're very conscious that it's aligned to those people, that we're not just sympathetic to their, their needs, that we're empathetic. And we absolutely make that shift into what's really important to other people. Because when people are fulfilled and that's aligned, I think it's also connected to well-being. You feel you have a contribution that's linked. Something that's it's really me to work here. It really suits me. And that's something that's a great thing to say. Great thing to feel. I'm nearly done. You can see it building. That's so anticipation of it doing it. Like a bit of drama. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the personal development piece and climbing the ladder and becoming coming up the building maybe to the top floor. But coming up in society too. And I think this is becoming increasingly about realizing personal ambition, of course, and aligning to your core beliefs. And I think we're going to see, we're starting to see a big shift, not just in ambition. But ambition linked to social change and ambition linked to, to shared rewards. You see something like the Coney campaign of a year or two ago, where the world united on a social issue, or a big political issue actually in the end. That's 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 the tip of the iceberg, the corner of the iceberg, I should say. That's that's the driver, and the generations that come next will be linked to the social agendas of our organisation. We're here to do this and do that, and make the world a better place. The generational responsibility, I think, is going to be the, the key phrase for the next generation coming up, beyond the millennials who are well truly here. So let's think about the next one. Then that's what it's going to be about. That's going to be about saying, and it's not the social corporate responsibility, it's how are we building a better world? What of what we're doing makes that real difference? This is how my kids are going to choose where to work, who to work for, got the tools for the job, they're highly connected into their community, they're a place that adds value to their lives, and then actually through all that making a better world, even if they're working for a bank. And it's true, in fact the banks, I know it sounds simple, but, but the banks are the ones who are cutting onto this more than any other. Any other. So I think there's something about place that psychologically clicks into this. I think there's places that can duly inspire and humble us against this kind of um, but human achievement and yet what we still have to achieve. Have you ever been in a place that makes you think anything's possible? I was in a house the other day, so I had a beautiful water view, not such a fancy house, but it had a great view, and I thought, God, if I lived here, I had things I could do. Why did I feel that? Like, I still me. But you feel like there's something that you get.
get from a big empty space or, or what could you do if you were this organization and so on. So I really like to see spaces that inspire awe and get us all involved. Not just millions of lobby cafes necessarily, maybe some empty spaces with no Wi-Fi. We can just go, oh, look at the sky. We should save the sky. It's beautiful. There are just some ways to turn off. It kind of makes you think you could do anything with you. It's just almost nothing there. So I think sometimes the in-between spaces are some of the most important. And my final little bit of inspiration, I suppose, is this building. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a bizarre idea of building. It was very consumeristic. It was designed by uh, Zaha Hadid with Karl Lagerfeld, who runs Chanel, as an exhibition of the Chanel handbag. I mean, what an indulgent thing to do. <laughs> so, just forget the social cause thing, because it's totally not relevant here. But it inspired me. It was awesome. It was very, very, very unbelievably beautiful. And I say it was, because it was a demountable building. And I mean building, like an actually huge building. And they took it around the world to 20 locations, again, amazingly, ridiculously indulgent, but all inspiring in its own way. And I started to think, what if you could take a building to places to educate, to, to save lives, to work in, to be productive, what could we do? So it, it's not just about those empty spaces. Sometimes it's just about the amazingness of our human engineering and our achievements that, that line it all up. So some really big concepts and some really little starting points, I suppose. But at the end of the day, I think this is about providing the workplace of the future. It's about providing the tools for people, the right spaces to do the real work. And I mean the personal work and the communicative work. To connect your value as an organization to your place and really embrace that. And to not be afraid to have some or to develop people, to inspire in so many ways, if you can, even the little ways. And kind of that makes me feel like it was, we're right back at the beginning, that it was what it was always about, rather than the latest gimmick. It's what we've always known. Thank you.